Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ruben Uncut. Today's a very special um, conversation because I got I got my first um, politician on the show. Uh, we're, today we're talking with uh, Nathan Giros. Welcome to the program. Uh, Nathan, how are you doing? Oh, it's great to be here, Ruben. Thanks for having me. Thank you for agreeing to uh, come on. Um, now, to uh, to start off, I guess the most basic thing is we should establish what you uh, what is it that you are running for? Yeah, so I'm running for state representative in House District 34. That's basically from Hudson, Stowe, Monroe Falls, Silver Lake, Talmadge, and North and Northwest Akron. Okay, wow. All right. Um, I know a lot of people who live in those communities, so that's great. Um, all right. So uh, so also to tell the, the audience um, how we know each other, which is that uh, we both did karate together. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. I, it was about 16, 17 years of studying for me. I know you probably around similar. Mm -hmm. uh, it it took me, I think, uh, roughly 12 to 13 years before I uh, got to my black belt. Um, mm -hmm. Although to be fair, I was older when I started uh, than when you started. Right. I was five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was a little, little tyke there, mm -hmm. full of energy, but... It was about 11 years before I got my black belt, and I was oh, yes. right on my 16th birthday. So it was unique that most testings are on a Saturday, and mm -hmm. that just so happened to be the sa a day that I was able to test. So I was one of the few people that was able to test for their black belt right on their 16th birthday. Oh, my God. I forgot about that. Yeah. that's There was that whole party theme going on, too. That Yeah, no. Because uh, a, th a thing that um, listeners probably won't know about our the dojo that we went to, which was that... Um, you had to be 16 to get a black belt uh, was actually a rule we had. Um, if somehow, like, I don't know if I ever saw anyone accomplish it, but th the red belt was specifically mm -hmm. given to anyone who like somehow managed to train their way up to black belt, but was under 16. Right. Uh, I don't know if I ever saw anyone do that. Although there was one kid who was trying real hard. I can't, I can't remember his name right now. Yeah, I remember that. I think I could have maybe gone for it. But with the red belt, you'd have to test for your black belt testing all over again. That is that is true just, also. <laughs> just not worth it. Because I was in the dojo like five or six days a week for about a year. Mm -hmm. Just conditioning, preparing for mm -hmm. that, uh, doing private lessons, teaching classes. Because I know mm -hmm. a lot of in martial arts, even though they're senseis who are the black belts who are teaching, you also have the higher ranks that mm -hmm. are taking on more leadership teaching mm -hmm. classes, te leading certain portions of the lessons. Yeah. So doing all that for about a year and a half leading up to the black belt testing, as much as it was a great workout and great preparation, only want to have to do that once. That's fair. That's fair. Um, After my black belt, uh, my black belt was very exhausting. And like afterwards, like my body, the way my body felt, I my brain was like, if I worked out like this every time, I would either get incredibly in shape or I would die. <laughs> it would right. be one or the other. Uh, because like afterwards, I did just feel like, oh, just absolutely yeah. spent. Um, but uh, but yeah, uh, I lost my train of thought on that one. But uh, but yeah, no, we did karate together for a long mm -hmm. time. Um, yes. And which... that was just on, it was on the Hudson Drive and stuff. Yes. That was yes. Pit Tax, Ishmael Karate. I know it was uh, Debbie Pittak who had been there for, I mean, I, how many years did she study it? I mean, it was multiple I, decades, I, re I recall. I mean, it would have to be um, mm -hmm. because like we went there for over a decade and mm -hmm. and she had been a black belt for a while when we all joined. Right. So just using math, it's it's been, it was a long time for her. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a great time. I mean, some of those lessons you just take with you your entire life. But That's true. People have asked, you know, have you used your martial arts? And they're asking, have you punched somebody? Have you kicked somebody? And haven't really had to get into that scuffle. Yeah. But when it comes, comes down to the discipline, the perseverance, the respect, all of those different things, that, that, mo that motivation, that mm -hmm. teamwork was something that you carry with you all the time throughout your entire life. And so Abs I'm so absolutely. fortunate of having that experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, when I think about experiences I had when I was young that helped um, shape and form me, in, uh, karate is actually one of the big ones um, mm -hmm. in, in there. It really, it, it helped me understand a lot of things. It helped me understand my body more. It helped me understand um, discipline, um, working with other people. It, 
it got me jump started on the concept of teaching all those things. Yeah. Uh, oh, and respect and community. Just, there was just so much of value to get out of that. Exactly. What, I'm, what I also like too about it was like one of the main part of my campaign is the message on servant leadership, where it's not just about being the big boss telling others what to do. Servant leadership is about adding value to people's lives, that you're side by side with your team as opposed to being the, the big person in the chair telling us what to do. And so like with martial arts, I know whenever we would bow in, we'd start our lesson, we'd say, Ona Gaishimas, which was, please teach me. At the end of class, it was Domo or Agato Gazainmas, which was, thank you for teaching me. And it wasn't just the students who did that. Mm -hmm. It was the senseis also did that, the black belts, the teachers, because even though we are a black belt, we are the sensei teaching martial arts, we are also learning from the students. And it's Absolutely. that lesson that as leaders, we are always learning. We're always growing. A lot of politicians, they want to be the smartest person in the room. And I try my hardest not to be because you want to surround yourself with the smartest people. You want to surround yourself with the experts. And I think that's something that you learn with martial arts, that no matter how many level, tiers of black belt you are, or how much of an expert you are, we're always needing to be open-minded to the lessons that we can learn from those around us. We're, we are, we're just at the beginning and already you're saying a lot of the stuff I wish more politicians oh. said, like this, like, th like this, this philosophy you're putting out here is something I, I deeply feel is, is lacking in mm -hmm. our, in our political system right now. It just, it feels like we are at an all time high for, um, just people who are in it with their egos. Mm -hmm. Um, like we just saw what happened to George Santos. And right. That, it's like, oh boy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's astounding that he was able to get so far doing that type of behavior. I'm glad that finally there was consequences for that action. Because again, you always wonder, when is someone going to be the adult in the room and step in on this? And I'm glad that they finally got to that point. But it's, it's just astounding some motivations for people. And like, I, like even the term politician, I don't love hearing it. I mean, anyone who is running for office is one. But it's hopefully to kind of change that narrative of what really is a politician or a public servant, maybe a, like how I would try to describe myself. But I know it's, that is that is how I mean, that is technically what people in those types of positions are considered are, is public servants. And it mm -hmm. really feels like that's gotten lost in the in the shuffle these days. Right. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's trying to move back to it's not about me. It's about. Who, my constituents. I know there's uh, a state representative I talked to who had been there for a long time. And his advice to me was, it's not about who I am. It's about who I represent. And when you keep that in mind, it's, it's kind of taking into, I don't have to have every lived experience of the people in this community. I just have to have the willingness to listen and find ways to include them in the outcomes uh, in the state legislature. That is, I, I'm not going to have every detail but I want to find every detail. I want to find the right ideas in the community. And that just comes down to no matter what your ideology is, what you think on, you know, whether Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, where you stand on the issues, it's what kind of behavior do you bring as a representative? There are a lot of them that you know, I've helped with grassroots action where we encourage people to call their state rep, call their senator, call whoever, call Governor DeWine. And it's amazing how many people just don't pick up their phones. They don't call back. They don't have that responsiveness. And so it's trying to make sure that we rem remember that your this campaign is a job interview for who you want to be your voice. And then once you are in that position, it's all about the service that you're bringing to your community. Excellent. Okay. Um, so you, you mentioned before that you are running in a primary. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what... Uh, are you running as an independent? Are you with a party? Uh, what's your situation there? Yeah, so I'm running under the Democratic Party for their, the nominee. There are three of us in the primary, which is on March 19th. I think early voting is on about February 21st. Nice. I'm actually not. Sh I'm actually not sure if I'm in your district or not. Uh, but uh, it, yeah, it, which uh, are you in Akron? Uh, I am in an adjacent suburb. Okay. I well I'll, I need to be more specific than that. Okay, yeah, no. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna for uh for safety reasons, I'll edit this out, but I'll tell you <laughs> Okay, then you wouldn't be correct. That would okay. be just a 31. 
that's disappointing. Uh, I would have voted for you. Oh, well, thank you, Ruben. I appreciate it. Not a problem. Um, all right. Uh, well, so, so you're running in this primary. Do you, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I just for clarification, you are uh, you're running for state representative, as in you would represent it uh, with inside the state, not correct. OK, yeah. So the, the state house seat that I'm running for would be representing us in Columbus. So not to be confused with Congress. So our congresswoman is Amelia Sykes mm -hmm. and she was just elected back in 2022. OK, cool. All right. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. Uh, right. for I am who... not trying to challenge Amelia Sykes. I support her 100 okay. percent. And also, this is the same seat that was held by Casey Weinstein. Now, oh, okay. Casey Weinstein is running for state senator over the I think it's Senate District 28. But this is the House seat that he is moving on from. And so it is an open seat. So there's no incumbent. There's no there's not like a, someone I'm challenging in that regard. So it's an open seat that I felt that. This is a time and opportunity to step up, and that's where we're starting this campaign. Absolutely, fantastic. Um, I noticed on Facebook that you're uh, you're out there knocking on the doors, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, always nice to see that personal touch. Yes. Um, so what are some so what are some policies that are part of your platform? What are you What are some things you're wanting to bring to the table, so to speak? Right. Well, I know when I first put up my website, I had about 17 issues. And I was told, okay, cut those down to focus on some primary ones. And so the real main ones, the three that I have is education, public safety, and higher paying jobs are the three main ones that I'm going to be focusing on. The reason of education is that my background is in leadership development. So in addition to my past with martial arts, I am an Eagle Scout, was able to travel across the nation doing national programs for leadership and development, was even in China for a month working with Chinese students on leadership skills, and my master's degree is in organizational leadership. So from all those different experiences, I knew how blessed and fortunate I was to have learned emotional intelligence, leadership skills, diversity, inclusion, these concepts that are so essential in the 21st century workforce. And so one thing I really had a passion for was is but what if everyone had that equal opportunity, that you shouldn't have to have a master's degree in this field to learn how to lead yourself and work in a team? Or we look at whether it's a trade. If you're going to the trade, you might not get these opportunities, but everyone deserves that right to learn about leadership skills, so how to lead themselves, how to work in a team, how to identify quality leadership. And so one motivation for me running was when our Ohio House was considering banning diversity, equity, and inclusion learning outcomes, not just from high schools, but they're looking at trying to get rid of it from colleges. And so it's the irony of we want free speech and we want to be in a free country, but you can't teach the things we don't want you to learn about. And all this is we see the challenges in our country, the challenges in our state, that just comes from diversity, that we have differences physically, ideologically, behaviorally. And it's not that those differences are bad, it's just that we have to learn how to work with those differences to realize the expanded creativity and opportunity that diversity presents. And so unless we're actually teaching these skills, we're going to have a hard time coping with those differences. And so from conflict management, emo, uh, we talk about emotional intelligence, all in servant leadership, these concepts I've been working on for about the past seven years with a nonprofit I founded where we're in the schools teaching these skills. Uh, we've started over 4,400 students as of uh, 2018 school year, and just trying to create that equal opportunity, that equal access to the skill, these skills. Excuse me. So education is a really passion of mine because no matter what career you're in, no matter what your family life is, these skills are essential. Absolutely. Um, I actually, I mean, like education. You just start with the word, and already it's like, of course, we got to work on that. But yeah. like the way you expanded on it just there, you hit on some very like relevant issues and struggles that are currently facing education right now. Right. There is a, there is a surprising like backlash against the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, there's so many people out there right now who for some reason see this as some type of attack. And it's, uh, it's, it's strange, it's alarming that people are feeling that way because that's really not what any of that's about. It, right. it's, not, it's not about attacking any particular group. It's about helping groups integrate into each other and to understand one another. So yeah, I, I cannot I, agree more. 
absolutely. I, I'm super glad to hear that that's uh, something you're tackling because right now education is really under attack with that. Um, I remember I heard some of the policies that they were talking about doing to colleges in Ohio, and I was uh, alarmed. Yeah, as you should be. Yeah, no, like it's... The, the way they're moving against education, it almost feels like there's a concerted element right now to undermine education in, in our country. And that's, 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 de- that's going to be deeply problematic and have long lasting impacts on our society if that, if that moves forward. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to dramatically affect the poverty in our society. It's going to dramatically affect outcomes and workers and, and just everything. So right. well, I'm and, well, even recently, what just passed this year was the expanded school voucher system, mm-hmm. which basically is uh, on the Republicans on in the state legislature were advocating that it's school choice. You have a right to go to whatever school you want to. But the reality there is the expanded school voucher program just takes funding that is needed in the public school system and just takes that away. So it's a way of defunding our public schools mm-hmm. where the majority of students attend and are already limited on certain resources. And so, and they're talking about how it's going to give more choice, but a lot of private schools or charter schools have limits of how many students they are, they are willing to accept. So even the students they're claiming to be trying to create opportunity for, they're essentially leaving behind. And so we see how there's a lot of numerous attacks on education, even the way education is funded, where it's a lot through property tax, which the issue with that is that you have a wealthier district gets more funding from the property tax. And then you have a poor community getting less money and there is that inequity taking place. And our education funding system in Ohio is severely broken. Even a 1997 Supreme Court case ruled it was unconstitutional, yet it is still being done. And I think a lot of the challenge we have in our system is that we have these problems but we don't have the voice speaking out up against it. Because I, if I, when I do win, it'll be in the minority of the legislature. Because right now the Republicans hold a super majority. But we want to make sure we have a voice advocating these issues and making sure that people are aware of the things going on that are causing harm, and then find opportunities to say, well, what we can do to better fund and better support our communities. Absolutely, absolutely. I have long been um i have long been against the use of property taxes specifically for education because of the disparity that it creates it's a serious problem and like so poor schools are also just constantly having to pass more and more levies and it's almost never enough and then meanwhile as you have schools in wealthy areas where i i i used to have friends who went to hudson and like it was night and day compared to other public schools um, just like wildly wild disparity. And I used to live in Pennsylvania that has um, was ranked like 47th for educational disparity. And having lived in Pennsylvania for a minute, that's because there's a high level of disparity in Pennsylvania in general. Like sure. everything in Pennsylvania, I've always described like Pennsylvania as primarily being like parts that are Hudson and parts that are Ravenna and like mm-hmm. not a lot in between is how I would describe Pennsylvania. And we, that kind of thing is gonna mess up your educational disparity with these types of uh, funding. It's, it's not good. Yeah, well, and that's what also, I, go ahead. And I was also, I was just gonna say, there's also, um, I, I became aware of that, the fact that there's actually, um, specifically from the right is this attempt to make a, a distortion of like the outcomes based on funding where they will hold up federal like money that is given to schools and be like, see, schools that get more of this federal money don't have better outcomes. But it's like, that's because those schools are still underfunded based on their own revenue from, from property tax. Right. The reason they're getting more money is because they are severely underfunded. When you're pointing yeah. at the people who are succeeding without this extra funding, you're not really pointing anything out to us. Right. I remember there was an example when, because of my nonprofit work, we did a, a lot of different collaborations and communities, and they were almost showing like the differences with equity, where like if you're all trying to run the same race, but then all of a sudden they gave one person this big thick column of papers, and it goes that, that's a barrier for someone, and then added more and more. Now you have to run the same race. Well, the one who has 
nothing in their arms are going to run so much faster. But the ones who are labored with so much to carry, that's going to make it harder for them. Even though they start from the same position, right? We say about equality, but when there's that disparity, it creates a lack of opportunity and lack of real access to success. And we can't, of course, give people success, but we can give opportunity. And like when I've been in different schools, I've been in some schools where we talk about creative thinking. So we go, well, imagine the best version of your school. What does that look like? So instead of seeing a problem from a negative lens, right, how do you create a positive? And some schools, I go, well, we should have a restaurant in our school. Right, we should have this restaurant on that. And you're like, okay, that's creative. <laughs> I don't know how applicable, but they, that's appreciate the creativity. But then I've had schools where they're in the inner city and the one student, they're just going, you know, if there weren't fights every day, that'd be great. And so you're looking at just the difference there of it's hard to be in a learning environment when your physiological needs aren't met or your safety needs aren't met, that you're feeling like you're looking over your shoulder all the time because of this, this challenging situations, or it's hard for you to learn when you're hungry. Mm -hmm. I had a student one time is saying that, I guess he was, he was tired during the lesson, right? He had his head down and apologized for it afterwards. But the one thing he said to me was, I guess he got off work at midnight, didn't get home till 1230. And so he didn't, didn't get cleaned up and was in class at 7.15 in the morning. And so not like the student wasn't capable of learning, but it was just exhausted and was tired. And so we see a lot of these disparities where you might judge a school for one reason or another without seeing some of the underlying issues that take place, whether the challenges of poverty, challenges of low paying jo jobs. And so it's trying to correct not just more like a holistic approach. They also described it as a whole child approach to education. That it's more than just in the school building. It's how do we provide structures and systems and supports so that even outside of school, people have a better chance of being in a better learning mindset. Excellent. And um, so that, that makes me think of this. Um, right now, there seems to be a, a push in some areas to essentially stop doing like school lunches for the underprivileged and that's just i it just it just strikes me as such a terrible idea to take that away i agree like it's sometimes i i'm genuinely shocked by the lack of empathy in in our society and and like even and like honestly even like if i were to position it from like a, a version of self-interest my my same thought would be the better outcomes that all students have the better society we're building for the future like that we we, we don't the average person does not benefit from the poor having bad outcomes yep exactly and i remember too like one of growing up watching John Stewart. I don't know if you're familiar with it. All I'm of very his. familiar with John Stewart. I, yeah, I figured you would be, yes. <laughs> and I remember he, he outlined it perfectly where he goes, if the rich take advantage of the government, they're smart. But if the poor do it, they're moochers. And the thing is, what we, we need to realize is that there are some challenges some people face and live, giving that little, kind of raising the floor up just to give that extra support versus bailouts or tax cuts for the wealthiest people, they're not going to miss that tax cut in the top 1% or the top people. But that kid not getting a lunch impacts his entire their entire day mm -hmm. and, and how their ability to learn and yeah. Potentially whole life, really. Exactly. It's it's we live in a society where it's very easy to fall behind and not that easy to get ahead. Right. It's it's uh, which is a serious problem in uh, in our type of uh, in our type of system with upward mobility. People don't understand how important upward mobility is for a society. And right now, that's not a thing we're doing well. <laughs> no, we, we have a lot of work to do on uh, trying to provide more opportunity for others to really have that balance. I know like we have that idea that, you know, if you're not ahead, you're just not working hard enough. Mm -hmm. But I've seen a lot of people who are working two or three jobs at a time. They're working plenty hard, mm -hmm. but they're just not getting that relief where rent is getting higher, more harder to find where they live, or maybe they're having a hard time just, you know, paying bills, paying their for food. And I know when I was talking with members uh, in the community, they're saying that, why is there crime? Why is there drug dealing? Why are there all these different challenges? 
And then it comes down to the low paying jobs that when you mm -hmm. can't even, when you're working all these hours and you can't feed your family, that leads to people taking action that otherwise would cause harm, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's criminal activity is, but you bring in higher paying jobs that you're able to have a work-life balance with, you're not working 80, 100 hours a week, that's going to bring about a reduction in crime. It's going to bring a reduction in these extra ways of acquiring money that are contrary to maybe the law. Mm -hmm. And so it's finding ways of when we have those higher paying jobs, whether it's helping with uh, job training, because there's a lot of opportunity in, like for example, computers and technology. Uh, we look at the trades. There's a lot of great jobs in the trades, and that's where it's supported us with unions that have helped access that and have fought for better wages, better benefits, who really organized and protected labor. So when we protect unions, we protect trades. These are some ways of helping develop higher paying jobs that really are allowing you to have a work-life balance, that you can do the hard day's work, but also have that time with your family go on the golf course, play a video game, whatever, that you're allowed to have fun too. And I think so many of the people who are either uh, lower income or mi middle class are struggling to find that work-life balance, not because of, the, like everyone tells you to have a work-life balance, but some people just don't have the capacity to do so because they have to pay their bills, have to pay for food, have to pay for housing. And these necessities that they don't have that balance because of the system that we're in now. Absolutely. I... A lot of people don't even seem to like if like a lot of people don't put themselves in the in the headspace for it. Like the honest answer is if your family is starving and so, and you look out and you see like that people who sell drugs have seem to have money and some type of equity there, you're mm -hmm. it might not seem that crazy for that person to be like, I've got to feed my children. Maybe I should sell crack. Like it's not, that's actually not insane. It sounds kind of funny when I say it, but like desperation right. breeds desperate measures. And a lot of people come into that game when they're, when they're very young. Mm -hmm. uh, so that a part of that is because they grow up in situations where they don't see the opportunities. Yeah. And, and to be fair, that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities. But awareness of opportunities is also a big part of what we're talking about, because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't even understand what opportunities they have. Right. And our society is not really trying to change that. Right. Well, and the thing is, that's where we look at our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. The healthcare we can provide is some of the best in the world, but our access to that healthcare system is one of the worst. Mm -hmm. right? And so we have to find ways to make sure that these resources are accessible to people in the community, that they can get these get the supports they need, find the jobs and the job training to kind of lead more lead a path that's more healthier, I guess would be a good way of describing it. Because these are challenges that some of us have no knowledge of. We don't know what it's like. And it's so easy for someone kind of from the top end looking down on people going, well, you just have to do this. Mm -hmm. I think we've all had people who have done that, a, a boss or someone that's, yeah, that's an easy fix. Absolutely. Go and do this. And then you have the, t like, for example, teachers going, okay, yeah, you come down here in the classroom and you try that. You know what I mean? It's not as easy when you're on the ground actually experiencing it. And that's one, another reason why I'm looking at running for office, or why I'm running for office is that we need to have that understanding of what it's like for people, not in the wealthier class, but also from people who've are in the middle class, who are in the lower class, to have their voices heard. Because if you don't have someone to, who is willing to give that voice or give that, lend that ear, you're going to keep getting the same thing. And I think we need to look more toward what kind of future can we have and start leading toward that sort of an outcome. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people right now also don't seem to even really understand some of the, the problems that we're facing. Like we are uh, we are, I believe it's currently at a record rate of homelessness mm -hmm. and a record rate of like first time homelessness, people who've never been homeless before. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just a lot of misinformation out there about the experience of homelessness. Mm -hmm. I, um, in a previous episode of my podcast, I was uh, reacting to an episode of Dr. Drew's podcast. Okay. And like in the very end of it, he just goes starts saying the most like ridiculously wrong things about homeless people 
And I was I was honestly floored that it was that he was saying some of the things that he he basically just implied that all homeless people are, are drug addicts and like even like tried to fight the concept of like um, single mothers as being a large homeless population, which they are like statistically, we have the right. data, uh, single yeah. mothers make up the majority of homeless families and and homeless families make up like a third of homeless people. So it's it, it's it's wild how many people don't understand the real problems of homelessness. Exactly. Well, and even like homeless veterans. Yeah, I mean, we have, though, we are so willing as a country, as a community to send people into challenging circumstances, difficult situations. But then when it comes down to getting them access to jobs, getting them access to housing and then the supports they need, we drop the ball too many times. Absolutely. And so, and then even with that, where it's astounding how we have that mindset of people who have less than us are somehow doing something wrong. And we almost feel like they're justified or that it's that punishment for a decision when not everyone has the supports or access to them as we, you know, as other people mm -hmm. do. I know there's when I was in high school, there was a program I was with and someone, their house burned down, but they had the ability to, they were living with a family member during that time that they were able to get themselves back on their feet. Not everyone has a family member or a friend that they can do that with if they're in that circumstance. And I think there's a lack of empathy sometimes that we have in our society. And I think the more people who are raising awareness on these issues, but also providing resources. So something that happened back in when Governor Kasich was governor when he took over in 2011 is they pulled municipal funding. So all the funding that would be going from our state state income tax going to the cities to help them with their most common expenses, which is normally fire, police, EMS, emergency services. When Kasich pulled that to have a inflated budget surplus, and that was mostly because he was trying to have a larger budget surplus so he could run for president and say, look how great the surplus is. He basically defunded the police. He defunded fire. He defunded our communities that local governments had to decide, do we cut those three, EMS, fire, police, or do we raise city taxes to cover those losses? And Governor DeWine has kept that going. And so we want to look at all these different resources that could be plugged into our communities, this funding that could go to support housing initiatives that could be supporting. I know in, in Stowe, they wanted, they wanted a splash pad in Skip Park, right? And that was a huge debate over in Stowe. And so it's like some of these things, whether it's for parks, for recreation, whether it's, I know another thing in Stowe and that uh, the Monroe Falls area, they've talked about even just school security in their elementary schools. That, of course, not for the students themselves, but because we live in what I like to call the wild, wild Midwest, that just any, you know, we have these, the one, some of the weakest gun laws in the nation, that they're saying, well, we need to make sure that we have an officer there just for protection. And so we have to look at making sure that our communities are getting the resources they deserve, that when we have a f over $5 billion surplus, that's not something to boast about. It means that we're overtaxing our communities because the money's not being invested in what you need, it's just being padded into our bank account, going into the most excessive rainy day fund in the entire nation. We should have a rainy day fund, but we also need to be investing in the rainy days that are happening in this community. Nicely put. Oh, Nicely thank you. put. I will say, I I will say, um, student resource officers are something I've I've looked into a little bit, mm -hmm. and um, they have an alarming failure rate. Mm -hmm. um like the actual number of like incidents of shootings or violence that have been stopped by uh student resource officers mm -hmm. not a high number it's like mm -hmm. two um which is alarming there's also an indication that shooters might come more heavily armed uh when they know they're a police present so it's it's a very complex situation sure. Yeah. So um, when talking like with the local government, some of what they've been advocating is they see that as a deterrent in some cases. Mm -hmm. So that's someone who just ha is having the bad day, deciding that they're going to target a school, that that resource offers a way of acting as a deterrent. Mm -hmm. I think a better way of deterring it is by getting rid of some of these loose gun laws that we have in the state, that we have a lot of 80 percent, 90 percent of people saying that just expanding background checks mm -hmm. are important. And I want to be very clear, I'm, I'm pro-Second Amendment, but as it's written, 
a well-regulated militia. And what we have in the state is anything but well-regulated. So Absolutely. it's one of those things where I think resource officers is a reactive way of handling the situation. Mm -hmm. And we need to be more proactive in protecting legal gun owners to have their guns, but also making sure that the wrong person is not having an, an easy way of acquiring such a deadly weapon. No, absolutely. The, a, a great deterrent is actually paperwork. Paperwork is a great deterrent. It is, isn't like, it? Like, yeah, no, because a stall, like when you stall out people, like there is a certain level of, there are going to be people in society who are who have a level of determination that is unstoppable if if they put their mind to something they're going to do it mm -hmm. but the reality is is that that is not most people mm -hmm. uh, especially people who might be dealing with mental illness or or depression or, or anything that would fall under those in those areas those people are going to have less energy and patience for something like background checks filling out paperwork and some people might even be like well they might just buy it illegally okay but here's another thing. Not everyone's going to know how to do that. Not everyone right. knows a good gun dealer yeah. that can illegally get a gun from. You don't just have like a black market dealer on speed dial. It, it, they're not in the phone book if, they, if those are yeah. even still around. Yeah. Yeah. You just Not as easy as people claim it is. Yeah. Yeah. You, you pretty much already have to be running with some gun nuts to get those types of uh, those types of things. Right. And another problem that we're seeing is that um, states that do have the laws that would help stop these situations, um, the police just don't seem to enforce them, mm -hmm. uh, which is a serious a serious problem. Uh, like that's what happened up in uh, in Maine. Uh, there were numerous reports against that guy. There were numerous people who tried to contact the police to say that he was dangerous, and just nothing got done. Mm -hmm. And right. of course, if you're going to defund your municipality, you're not helping that either. <laughs> Correct. Right. When you're asking so much of your law enforcement that they don't have the capacity to do so, that can be a major challenge as well. I did not know Kasich did that. That is actually pretty mind blowing. Right. Yeah. We talked to a lot of the different mayors in the community that had to do with less because of that lack of that pulling of municipal funding. Such a it's such a cheap trick, too, when you think about it. Like he's like, oh, I'll just <laughs> take all your money. And it looks like right. I have extra money oh my god that's so summed up pretty well yes yeah no that's the con artistry is impressive uh right. well that's where you look at all that funding that would be going to schools or would be going to the communities because every community is different with what they need as i mentioned some of those key things some for parks some for education some for safety uh one of the things I've done as well as I've spoken to like the fire chiefs association of Summit County earlier this year, and we were had a half day session on emotional intelligence and we were talking about engagement. So instead of job satisfaction, we also talk about job engagement and they say what normally disengages them the most is a mix of burnout work overload. Cause they say there's a, a concept called making sure that the task resources are matching the task demands, right? So that you have the ability to follow through on what your task is supposed to be about. And they were saying that's the hardest because their budget gets less and less, they have fewer firefighters, but the 911 calls still come in at the same rate. So we look at that lack of support for our safety. We need to make sure that these communities have the resources they need to provide the services for you or for the public, because when you pay taxes, those are investments in yes. things that help the community, not just to make the state have a higher budget surplus, because that surplus is just is not being invested in you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like that, there is there's so much misunderstanding around taxes itself, uh, from what I from what I find is that a lot of people in this country seem to think of taxes as like some type of of punishment or control mechanism or just like a waste but it's like no this is how you invest in a society right yeah do you want roads mm -hmm. do you want when you are hiring somebody do you want them to be well adjusted knowledgeable well prepared because of the education system or do mm -hmm. you want to have to spend a year or two doing the education yourself and so that all do you want safety do you want parks, you want a, a nice downtown, whatever it might be for you, right? Those are investments that take place that otherwise would not be 
if we just had the feudal system and we just were all completely hands off, everyone for themselves. I think that again, I like to see it as more so investments in absolutely community. That is that is absolutely how I think of taxes is an investment in our society and our communities. Right. Um, it's like sometimes you'll like talk to some like very like pro uh, privatization type people. And like sometimes when I'm talking to them, it's like, OK, yeah, we you do you really want to rely on corporations to build your roads and deliver your services all the time? Because that's how you get oligarchs. That's where <laughs> oligarchs come from. <laughs> Right. Well, it's also where inequity comes from, too. True. Because True. if you don't have the capacity to pay for that thing, then you don't get that thing, whether it's roads mm -hmm. or access to certain things or healthcare access, things like things that a lot of us would think are just part of being human and the humanity behind it, that someone's sick. We want them to have affordable access to that care. We want to make sure that with education that I remember there was one school I was at. They were talking about one kid who kept being late all the time and they found out well the kids was homeless and so it's sometimes hard to get to school when there's the shelter that maybe he and his family was a part of to get to class and even though he was late he was still there yeah no it's we we fail to understand the struggles that others might be working through right. so often uh, I used to, I, this is jumping back a little bit, but I actually used to work in, uh, I used to work in insurance. Um, so I actually, I got a pretty unique inside look at how our uh, Medicare system works. And uh, that, I mean, obviously that's not something you'd be dealing with because mm -hmm. that's more of a federal level, yeah. but like people really don't seem to understand that health insurance really is just kind of like a privatized form of taxation. Mm -hmm. Like it's literally, like it works the same way. People are putting funds into the pool and some people are taking out more than they put in and some people are putting in more than they take out. And like, that's how insurance has, are, has always worked. And actually I've, I've, if there's one thing that I've, I've noticed like politicians don't seem to understand, it is actually insurance. Um, like- sure. Both Barack Obama and Donald Trump both were like, you're going to get to keep your doctors. And it's like, how? Because like, that's not a thing. That's just not a thing that happens. Like an insurance company could drop your doctor. Your doctor could drop the insurance company. These things happen literally all the time. There's, unless you're going to make a law that says all doctors have to take all insurance. Right. That's not going to happen. Uh, you can't promise that. And then like, and then when Paul Ryan said that, <laughs> that the insurance needed to stop being uh, healthy people paying for sick people. It's like, hold on, Paul. That's literally the business model. That is the concept, yes. That is, yeah, that is the business model of all insurance. And that doesn't just apply to health. That's life insurance. That's car insurance. That's all insurances, Paul. What are you talking about? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh... Healthcare is a serious issue in the society. Um, I, I personally uh, would be in favor of some type of public option because uh, I worked with privatized. Uh, essentially, I worked. We we don't talk about it, but we privatized Medicare. That's mm -hmm. what that's what Medicare Advantage plans are. It's the privatization of Medicare, and the advantages of privatization are not what people think they are. Right. Um, because Medicare was specifically built to be broken like it was it was designed to not cover everything because the insurance companies wanted loopholes that they could fill with their coverage and that's why medicare doesn't work the way it really should but like i said that's a federal issue right i know i would love to have the opportunity to tackle that or hopefully those in our congress mm -hmm. decide to do something in this next year Mm -hmm. I know we talk about the challenges they've been facing with just picking a speaker and trying to do anything, but we'll mm -hmm. try to see what we can do in Ohio's legislature, but can't make too many promises there, but well, hey, maybe you raising the issues though, because I think one of the biggest issues is that I feel like oftentimes Democrats are very reactive in mm -hmm. their policy that it's here's what the Republicans are doing wrong and we're not them. Mm -hmm. But then the common response is, well, every politician or all everybody's corrupt mm -hmm. or everyone's 
wrong. Mm -hmm. But really it should be, well, what do we stand for? And what we saw recently was when we were for issue one and we were for issue two, 57% of the people said yes. And that's because it's more about what we are for and our platform and making that more vocalized, making that amplifying that voice than it is just about well, what we're against. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I'm hoping to kind of bring along this campaign trail. And then when elected is to make sure that we are raising these ideas, raising these issues. So when they're not being done, if we're in the minority, when they go, well, why is that happening? We can say, well, go talk to the majority. This is what we would be doing if we had the majority in the House or the Senate or both. And it's because we have to start having that clear compare and contrast of what Democrats are looking to do and what Republicans are trying to do and say, which option do you want? Because one is going to be working for you. The other one seems to be working for other interests. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, OK, so this is kind of on the same topic, Go but ahead. is state related. Um, a thing that super annoyed me is that Ohio is privatized their Medicaid to basically function in a similar capacity to uh, the way that national medicare works where you get like assigned to a private company now who are just contractors for the state and it's like what is the purpose of having multiple medicaid programs guys what is who benefits from this no one benefits from this you're not you're not say you're not even saving the taxpayers money like that's the thing is that like the, the privatization in health insurance doesn't save taxpayers money it just changes where that money is going it's it's right. It's ridiculous. Also, I I gotta say I don't appreciate um I don't appreciate I don't appreciate Ohio's uh, approach to um uh, to SNAP. Mm. I don't the work the work for SNAP program that we have in Ohio. It's just like is this who, who this isn't saving anyone money? Like offering free labor to corporations. So that in exchange for your your food your your food card is not who does this benefit? This is not this is not a real value. It's I think it's just something they do because there's a portion of our society that likes the idea better that poor people would have to work to get these things. At least that's my that's my my take right. on it. Well, it's that if they don't like the program, they try to find ways to make it unappealing or create more barriers. And mm -hmm. we need to be finding ways to remove some of these barriers. I mean, ironically, it's almost like they create more bureaucracy. They create more steps when they advocate for less government or less things in the mm -hmm. way. Yeah, no, actually, that's uh, that's a big that's a big part of it is actually that um, a number of studies have pointed out the fact that. Um, oh, my God, what's the word? Uh, when. Uh, Oh my God, how am I forgetting the word? It's when you're when you're essentially testing people to see how poor they are to uh -huh. get something. Uh, oh my God, what is the word for that? It's blowing up. It's, it's that's gonna drive me crazy now. But like essentially, those types of uh, means testing, means okay. testing is actually really expensive. <laughs> like we spend so much money on means testing because we're afraid that someone might get help that doesn't need it. Um, even though that's like a big cost to those programs right it's it's interesting i know there's a lot of times where i think we teach smart goals with my program it's so specific measurable attainable relevant timely and we spend so much of our time trying to find ways to make things measurable that we don't always stop to think if it's relevant mm -hmm. and so we want to see that's because i know there's a group in akron a leadership group that i've done work with they're called heart to heart leadership nonprofit is leadership consulting they have a quote that says, some of the most important things in life cannot be measured. This means that how do you measure the leadership potential of somebody, right? It tends to be more qualitative. It can somewhat even be seen as subjective, but having these opportunities to foster that inside out approach to your leadership or your personal life, your emotional intelligence helps guide you in other ways. And so we look at how do you measure something like that? I usually said, do we come up with all these measurements, but do we stop to think, are they relevant? Mm -hmm. sometimes you can still have impact. Uh, mm -hmm. When I started my nonprofit many years ago, I had some advice from someone. He was talking about the like, measurement versus impact and so forth. Because how do you measure the success of an after-school dance class? Right? It's kind of hard. Is it how well the kid can do a twirl? But we don't realize that that was an opportunity for that kid, let's say he, right, that he was able to have a, some place to go after school. 
So instead of maybe hanging around the wrong crowd, instead of being, you know, finding something to do that may have been unproductive, mm -hmm. he had a place to go. He had a community, he had a family around him that, that taught him how to dance. He didn't have to be a professional dancer, but that gave him something every week or every, you know, whatever that was, something to practice gave us a sense of purpose. You can't measure that on a, a statistic or a spreadsheet, but that has impact in someone's life. And so there's times that we have to look at a more holistic approach to when we are looking at our government services or looking at how we how we look at other people. And that's one thing I think is a different perspective than maybe other people who are in government. Very good. Um, I think that this this goes back a little bit to education, but like, um, I'm a big supporter of the arts. I think the arts are very valuable to our society. They they lend people a sense of meaning and they give people things to do that get out some of these energies that might go in unproductive directions otherwise. I I think that the arts are often overlooked in our in our education system and are are frequently the first things that they will try to cut back on and i i think that that is ultimately a, a net negative on oh. on those communities right well like even in my youth i did theater growing up i know my very first paycheck was with magical theater company i got nice. 25 dollars to be in their christmas show and i remember and then throughout my life and did some theater in my youth and even with starting my nonprofit organization, right? You don't just start out with full funding. And so I was doing gig work on the side. I've DJed weddings. I was doing murder mysteries, uh, doing performances in Ohio. Even like there was a few times we were in New York and New Jersey, Pennsylvania. So I kind of toured around doing different shows and performances while supporting the non my efforts for the nonprofit. And just knowing how impactful that was in my life as an actor, but I also think what's interesting about actors, and I know you've done theater as well, you've been in the arts, is that people who are in the arts, I believe, tend to have more of an empathetic approach to their lives because when you are taking on a character, you're taking on their perspective, their their demons, their the positives about them, their hopes, their dreams, and that allows you to really put yourself in someone else's shoes, which is the entire premise of acting. And then when you take that into the real world, it helps us be more empathetic to see how someone else might be feeling, what, why they do what they do. Uh, we, I know that another quote someone has once told me, he goes that uh, we tend to judge others by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. And when we change that perspective, right, we always want to hold people accountable for what they did we don't always see the intention, the motivation behind them, but we like to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt of why well, didn't it mean for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we start seeing the intention behind people's actions, we're going to have more of a sense of empathy, compassion, and understanding, but we have to seek that understanding, which I think most of us want to stay within our worldview, our perception. We don't want to see the other perspective in fear of maybe our worldview being wrong or less effective than maybe what we think it is. Very well put. Well, thank you. The, cause that is, that is all very, that's all very true. And now I might be, I might just be saying that cause philosophically I view myself as a perspectivist. I, I believe that everyone is sort of shaped by their perspective and they, mm -hmm. at the same time, they are shaping their own perspective. Uh, I find society to be a two-way street. It is influencing us as we influence it. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it's very hard for people to escape their own perspective. In many ways, our own perspective can be a cage that prevents us from seeing things that, were, that we should have seen. Right. So, well, Nick, even like diversity and inclusion, when we're teaching that, I talking with the students that perception is often reality in most people's minds. It's why we can see the same exact facts and perceive them entirely different. And so that's all about when we talk about ideological diversity, it's that someone might see some the same thing, but perceive it in a different way. True. And in, in the best leaders are the ones who know how to see someone else's perspective doesn't mean you have to agree with it by any means. But if you look at like speech and debaters, some of the best speech and debate 
members know that you have to be able to debate either side equally well. And the only way you can do that is by having an open mind to see what is the counter argument, what is the other side. And if we did that more often, maybe we can find more common ground. Because even I've worked well with people who are on the farthest to the left, and I've worked well with Republicans and everyone in between. And it's normally trying to see, well, where do we, what do we have in common? Do we treat each other with respect and dignity that even though we disagree or we see something differently in this instance, maybe there is, what's the real motivation behind it? That we always try to assume the worst out of someone who disagrees with us. But if we try to see where we are more aligned or what we have in common, we can kind of move forward in a more constructive way. Nice. Now, um, you mentioned that higher paying jobs is mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, you're very interested in. Yes. Um, I would say that I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I, and I say that because I, I have two jobs. Um, technically, I have a, technically, you could say I also do, I also have a side gig, but um, that's just occasionally getting paid to do comedy. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, but my two main jobs is that I work for a nonprofit called the Center for Applied Drama and Autism, where I uh, teach theater to um, youngsters and teenagers who uh, have autism or other uh, disabilities. And also I work for and also I work for a company called Ardmore, uh, where I provide essentially um, uh, they call it HPC or uh, home professional care. Okay. Or personal care, home personal care, uh, which essentially just means that I help people with disabilities do like errands and make sure they get to doctor's appointments and things. Yeah. And um, the thing about those, both of those things are are a struggle for me financially, though, because uh, nonprofits, uh, the funding for nonprofits is hard to get. Right. Like a lot of nonprofit funding is based around like everyone's ready to give out project-based money everyone's like oh yeah you're doing a project we'll give you some money but like no almost no one is there to be like oh you have employees who need to get paid to do things like payroll oh i'm sorry we don't have money for that uh, unless they're doing a project <laughs> it's like ah make it so hard to oh. keep keep people on payroll when you do that um but also uh when i do h uh hpc work um, that's, uh, I do that through a nonprofit who gets their funding from the Department of Disability in Ohio. And the thing about that is, is that um, people in my position and uh, people who actually work a lot harder than me mm -hmm. also, um, our pay is capped yeah. because it comes from state funds. And people just are like, oh no, you know, what? No, I don't want tax money going to these people so they can have a living wage to do an right. important service. And it's very that's very frustrating, especially since I work in a job where it's hard to get good quality workers. Right. And part of that is because it pay like I think it just got rate. It's like it's it's a little over thirteen dollars an hour now. Mm -hmm. And when yeah. I started, it was like only twelve. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. like that that can be that can be very frustrating because. I know that if I worked for a private organization, I would get more money yeah. uh, is another thing. But also I would, but also like there would still be people who needed my quality of service who can't get the private care. Yeah. And like, that's like, it's, it's almost like we've, we've created disincentive structures for people who have the least opportunities. Yeah. Well, I know, I know that very well because with my nonprofit, I know it's like to start it. And then I, they always say, well, before you get funding, you need to have data. Well, you need the data to get the funding. And so it's kind of that uh, catch-22 mm -hmm. there that you're always trying to seek that extra You funding. just reminded me that I have some data I need to fill out for my job. <laughs> hey, I am glad to help out any way I can. But like even with that, so we have that mentality of even in the nonprofit sector that you want to have good people and you want to keep those good people and you have to take care of them. And we see a lot of the nonprofit side of things where they like the work that's being done, but don't always have the same supports for it. Cause you're basically funded through philanthropy mm -hmm. because the people who otherwise, or the people who benefit from your services 
wouldn't be able to pay for the services you're providing. The kids at the inner city schools that I'm teaching leadership for, they're not spending $5,000 you know, for a 90 minute session or a half day session that many corporate trainers would be paid. I mean, just recently I was uh, flown out to Missouri for a diversity and inclusion training. That was a corporate training. That was a different level of what, what they were able to pay me to go do that versus what is done in the schools is different. And that's where the nonprofit sector, it's a very challenging uh, world there, but it's so needed. And mm -hmm. I remember being in a group of nonprofits and they go, a lot of people in government don't see the impact that we're making on these lives of whether it's students or whether it's on people experiencing homelessness, whether it's addiction and recovery. I know even some, there's organizations here in Summit County who work on reentry, which means basically when someone has been in prison and now they're, they've finished their sentence, helping them get jobs, helping them get back on their feet so that they can lead productive lives. And most of these things don't have, you know, the person just getting out of prison doesn't have a lot of money to spend on helping gain job training and skill development, getting the right resources, but there are nonprofits who do help that. And so I think too, expanding opportunities for nonprofits is a motivating factor for me because these are the people on the ground level doing some of the hardest work serving communities that otherwise wouldn't have these resources if not for that nonprofit. And a nonprofit doesn't mean that the people working there have to not eat. Yeah. <laughs> they have a right to have a living wage and can have that work-life balance. But I yeah. too have worked that second or third job, even just running a nonprofit, that 1099. I know what that's like to get that 1099 slip and know mm -hmm. how that works. Absolutely. 1099, not fun. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, then you have several of them. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, so they recently raised the uh, they recently raised the state minimum wage to mm -hmm. I believe it was ten dollars and ten cents an hour. Right, because they're like LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, so that's that's some kind of progress. But as someone who makes like thirteen dollars an hour, I gotta be honest. Yeah, it's not it much. No, it's not much. Like. Like 40, yeah, no, it's just, it's not, it's not much. Like, I don't think people really think about it too much. Like if you made a thousand dollars a month, that's only $12,000 a year, right. which I would love to make a thousand dollars a month. That would be good. Uh -huh. I would be good for me. Yeah. I got a great exactly. deal on my rent. So I, so if I could make a thousand dollars a month, that would be a huge improvement in my life. And I would still be poor as hell. Uh, that's <laughs> yes. That's the, that's like, that's the reality of a lot of these situations. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's a lot of those things are trying to find those greater resources to bring to the communities. Like some of the higher paying job tactics is helping people get certain jobs that can bring in those higher wages. Or like, for example, when we see the effects of unions, which are now uh, there's like, it's the highest approval rating since like the 60s. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing, for example, the auto workers. Some of the success they did was you had Toyota and some of these other non-union man car manufacturers increasing pay by 9% across their all their jobs because they're trying to motivate them not to unionize. So even though they're not in a union, they're benefiting from the unions challenging the the bosses, the executives saying that they're deserving that fair wage. And so trying to take those same concepts and move into other sectors to increase better wages, better benefits for everyone. But I think there's a lot of opportunities that aren't being utilized to invest in like the philanthropic side of things of the community as well. Yeah, we are, we are, we do seem to be going through a, um, a good era for unionizing yes uh which is nice that actually gives me a, a sense of hope mm -hmm. uh for a lot of our our society and hopefully our economy because a lot of people don't realize this but like points where we had strong economies were also points where we had a lot of unions yeah uh so and unions are a big part of like where how we maintain a middle class so like yep. this is this is all very important stuff and for so long, America seemed to buy like the anti-union uh, propaganda. Mm -hmm. and, and now it really feels like we're getting a, a turnaround on that, which gives, yeah. does give me a lot of hope. 
Uh, exactly. I know like I had family members who were active in unions, like my one great uncle, he only had an eighth grade education, was a World War II veteran, and he was a cement truck driver. He got injured on, injured on the job, but because the union, he was with the Teamsters, he was able to get the benefits and the pension he needed that he was able to now technically retire early, but when you're retired because of an injury, that's different than just retiring. True. But because of that, otherwise, in those same instances at that time, they could have said, here's a thousand bucks. Sorry, you got hurt. Good luck. And send him on his way. Because of unions, he got the benefits and the support he needed through his injury and the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And even my dad worked for Acme. He was part of the uh, UFCW. And so it was part of that union there. And so you see how unions have impacted lives to challenge people, challenge businesses to treat their employees better. And I think that's a major part of higher paying jobs in the community is keeping and protecting unions in the state. There's a lot of efforts or what's called right to work, which mm -hmm. is legislation that basically allows people to get union benefits without paying union dues, which all that does is weaken unions' abilities to function and organize. And that's the whole concept is they have the ability to organize against executives, against people who may be trying just to profit off of the work of the everyday person. Yeah, and right right to work is also one of those legislative things where it's like, it's it's almost like like a double speak type of thing in yeah. terms of like what type, what the legislation's actually gonna do, which a lot like, first of all, right to work states frequently have some of the lowest pay, like right. just ter like terrible results in most right to work states. But the thing that no one tells you is that right to work also means the right to fire you whenever they want which is and for whatever reason yeah. yeah which seems deeply ironic uh with the title and whatnot quite ironic indeed yes so so yeah i i'm all about that if you can if you can help people get paid more in ohio i i'm all about that that's yeah I'll do my best yes all right so it was education jobs and what was the third one public safety uh oh Yep. Okay. So we, we kind of did touch on that with we did the, touch uh, on, yes. with the, with the fire departments, the police, the um, right. things like paramedics, I assume would also go under that. Mm -hmm. Yep. EMS. Yeah. Well, that's where it's just making sure that these communities have the resources they need to be effective. I mean, we think of $5 billion surplus, you know, you take half of that and just redistribute it to the communities per capita that how much of that, how many millions of dollars are going to be reinvested into communities that are, desperately need this support. And especially we see the impacts from COVID. I know so many people are quick to move on from it, but we, we did just live through a global pandemic, the size we have not seen in a hundred years. And there are still consequences and ramifications from that, that we have to get readjusted to whether it's seeing the flaws in our healthcare system, as we pointed out, maybe it's in all the access that people have to certain resources. We want to make sure that we have that accessible and that we are moving forward as a community and not just staying stagnant. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned that there were originally 17 things on your website, just out of curiosity. <laughs> Um, what were some of the things that uh, you had to de you sort of, sort of had to take the focus off a little bit? Yeah, well, my main thing was is I want to make sure that any issue that matters to somebody, I am taking a focus on that I care about too. So I was trying to have such a broad spectrum there, but things like small business support, mm -hmm. things such as protecting uh, LGBTQ rights, racial justice, even going into seniors, making sure they have. The supports they need as they enter an older age. Uh, those were some of various ones that we had. I, union was its own item as well, but I kind of have merged that with higher yeah. paying jobs that was already there. Mm -hmm. uh, even uh, the environment is also an essential one because again, that is, I mean, as an Eagle Scout, it wasn't, we weren't talking about climate change in Boy Scouts, but we were talking about how we should be protecting our environment, reducing pollution, I remember there was a phrase that I learned in West Virginia. It was an Indian proverb, and it said that we don't inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children. So it's kind of more about what we can give and how we leave this planet, how we leave our environment, more so than what we can take from it and how we abuse it. 
And so the environment is also a core component because we do have a lot of challenges with greenhouse gases and climate change that when we look at the future of this state and not just the state, but the future of the country and the world, we need to have leaders who are thinking about what does the world look like in 50 years? And is this, are we on the right path or do we need to start making some changes to be more proactive in making life better for our environment? Absolutely. There's a, I know there's a, I know there's an, uh, a saying from actually India, not to make things confusing, uh, but um, there's something, it's something about, it's, it's something about the wisdom of a man who plants a tree that he knows he will never sit in the shade of. Oh, uh, yes. I know the paraphrased version. Yes. Uh, yeah. I can't remember the exact quote right now, but like, there's, there's a lot to that. Like, I think that we've really, it really does feel like sometimes here in America, we've, and I'm sure other places in the world too, but it, it, sometimes it really feels like we've forgotten about that. That like the idea is to like make the future better, to make things more possible. Mm -hmm. And like, if you look at like progress throughout history, that's like all of it. Like, er, like, if you look at the progress that was made, it's always these steps forward to making life easier, making life more accessible, making life more livable, more survivable. Yeah. It's like that there's very few attempts at progress that were made to, quote unquote, make us. I don't know, like, like when we look at progress, it's not it's not it's not people like like punching like bashing their head against a wall to make their forehead stronger it's it's people going well, what if we tore down that wall what if you didn't have to make your forehead strong enough to break a wall sir we could make we could make progress instead yeah we could like oh like washing machines uh, uh everything everything was a step towards making it so that we had more free time, more, uh, more ability to invest in ourselves. Actually, that was a thing I mentioned, meant to mention earlier is that like, um, there's a lot of emphasis in America on like pursuing like your own goals and trying to have your own business or whatnot. But like, if you work over 40 hours a week, when are you going to have time to invest in yourself? Right. Like if you really want people to go out there and like invest in their dreams and try to make uh, become their own entrepreneurial spirit, you're mm -hmm. going to need to give them time to invest in themselves, invest in other skills uh, to fill out all that stupid paperwork. You need to start a job and everything. <laughs> right. People need time to do those things. And if they're busy working like 80 hours a week, they're probably not going to do anything besides work 80 hours a week. Right. Well, actually, when you were bringing up about like making life better in the future, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this, but I know John Adams, President Adams, had a statement where he said, "I study war and commerce, or war and uh, oh yeah, hold on, sorry, it was I study war and diplomacy so that my children can study trade and commerce, so that their children can study arts and literature, and and the entire premise of that is that life should be better." for the next generation. And I know there's many statistics saying that it's not the case with this current generation, but I like to see that one of the major differences between uh, maybe myself, or I had to see as more of the progressive or conservative side, where the more conservative side says, I had to go through this hard experience and you should too. Mm -hmm. Whereas many on the progressive side is, I had to go through this tough experience so that you don't have to. Yeah. And I think that's the difference between a progress-minded leader, representative, government versus one that says, well, it was tough for me. It should be tough for you. It should be tough forever is how do we make things better and add value to the lives of other people? Mm -hmm. No, exactly. It's, it's interesting. It, sometimes it feels like conservatives don't take any lessons from like popular culture. Like, <laughs> like why does Batman do Batman? Well, Batman does Batman because he doesn't want anyone else to like see their parents murdered in front of them. It's not right. like we're not going to stand around and be like, hey, Batman had to see his parents murdered. So you get to see your parents. <laughs> like, that's not <laughs> that's not a good attitude. And no, like, no, that's not. And like also like um, sometimes it really feels like no one was listening to Spider-Man. Like, oh, yeah. Like we live in a society where people hear like 
great pa- with great power comes zero responsibility now. People are like, ah, this in what? I have to be responsible, but that makes me feel less powerful. I don't like this. Right. Well, and everybody likes the word accountability. They mm-hmm. like to hold other people accountable, but they hate being held accountable. True. True. Very true. That goes back to the whole like judging people for their actions versus judging them for their intents too. Yeah. Although in fairness, we do have manslaughter laws for a reason. It's like this, Oh, correct. Well, yes. There's sometimes sometimes your intent doesn't really change the outcome. Well, correct. Yes. <laughs> On most cases there. Yes. Thank you for finding the exception. Yeah. Uh I'm sure there are other exceptions, but, but basically the, the, that's the gist of the thing. Yeah. Um yeah. Um, this is, I, have really, you, I, I hope that there are more politicians. Uh, I know we don't like the word politician, but I hope there are okay. more people who decide to run for office that can learn from some of the things you're talking about now. I, I genuinely having had this conversation with you. I genuinely think that you have a lot, uh, to offer our society. Thank you. Based on these philosophies that, and, um, and points that you've laid out for me. Oh. Um, I really, uh, I'll be rooting for you. Like I said, unfortunately, I, I won't be able to vote for you, mm-hmm. but uh, I uh, I will remind my parents to vote because they. Yes, they, that would be they, wonderful. They live in one of your districts. That'll. Yes. They live in one of your areas. That'll. Yes, they do. That'll work out. Uh, but yeah, no. Um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, to bring up or mention about your campaign? Well, I mean, as of right now, if people wanted to learn more about the campaign, you can go oh, to yes. my website, which is nathandrose.com. I am on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram as well. Um, if you are willing, I, again, there the part I hate the most about this, but it's, it's part of the process is uh, the fundraising side of it that, again, it takes a lot of money to lead a campaign like this. We're off to a great start, but if you're willing to chip in even you know, $25, $10, 5 whatever it is to you, we have a donation page on our website that would be very helpful because it is that grassroots movement moving forward, trying to have a different type of leader as a representative, one that's really focused on making serv- bringing servant leadership to Columbus. Excellent. Excellent. Now, of course, you're running in a primary. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm not even going to mention your opponents because they don't matter. We want you to win. Uh, well, that- thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, excellent. Excellent. Well, um, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining me on my podcast. Um, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being here and love the discussion. Yeah, no, I've, I've, had, I've really enjoyed hearing you talk about these things. Thank you. Um, I hope that uh, some people who can vote uh, for you uh, are able to hear this. Um, feel free, once it comes out, feel free to share it. Yep, uh, absolutely. And whatnot. Um, all right. Well, uh, in that case, uh, yes, everyone who's listening, please, please do, uh, if you are in one of his areas, please do go out and vote in the March primary for Nathan Jarose. Uh, what was the date of the, the March primary? March, March 19th. And early voting starts February 21st, whether it's absentee or early voting. Uh, Yeah. Please go out and vote and we'd love to have your support. Nice. I'm getting this episode out with plenty of time for people to learn about you. Nice. Excellent. (laughs) All right. Uh, You heard it here, folks. Go vote for Nathan Jaros. This is an official endorsement from the podcast. I hope there's not like a weird thing on Spotify against that because I'm doing it. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate it. All right. So uh, to, uh, to the listeners, thank you so much for joining us. Um, please do uh, follow on Spotify or check out the YouTube channel. Uh, that's Ruben Uncut on both of those platforms. Also available on other uh, podcasting platforms. But uh, And if you would like to contact the show, you can email the show at rubenuncut at gmail.com. All right. Once again, just thank you so much for joining me, sir. Great to be here.